to our finals friends i'm ailey loney alongside cory baumeister thank you very much for stopping by today hanging out with us as we try and find our champion cory i just have to say you are the best cory here so riley yes. can just go and uh take that back <laughs> retract that statement how dare you anyway <laughs> i know it's we have to unreal. find another riley. he's even daggering me He's daggering me, and I'm not even in the booth with him. That is some true love and some true friendship from my buddy Riley there. You know why? It's because we're so many miles away. He's just like, oh, I'm safe. He's never going to get to me. Just you wait. Just you wait. Friends, we are jumping straight into round number two with some more action. It's Corey Burkhardt versus Gregor Kowalski. Mono White, White Weenie versus Bant Ramp. So let's jump straight into the action here and see how this game shakes out. So during the Red Bull Untapped tournament, we saw White Weenie absolutely run over the field. Like Team of Reclamation got wrecked by these little itty bitty idiots. Corey, how is it going to do against Bant Ramp? Well, I think the Mono White deck is another deck like this Esper Midrange deck where it wants to play against Team of Reclamation every single round. But a card it doesn't want to play against is Shatter the Sky. And, it, and Bant also just has so many anti-aggro tools built into the deck already. So I would think this is going to be a very tough matchup for the better Corey B uh, in the hands of uh, Gregor Kowalski's <laughs> Bant Ramp deck. <laughs> Well, we're keeping a one lander here. We have two critters that we can play. So Corey's going to be hoping for another land off the top of the library here. Let's take a look and see what Kowalski's got to work with. Hydrocrasis. We've got some Uro there and Nisu shakes the world, but no growth spirals. So if anyone's playing along on that bingo card of growth spirals plenty, you're going to have to wait before you tick off the first thing. But there, as I say it, is the growth spiral. <laughs> <laughs> didn't have to wait too long, Alias. Didn't have to wait too long. Grow Spiral is always on the top of the deck whenever you are a Simic player. If it's not in your hand, it's on the top. We all know it. Of course. <laughs> so no second land here for Corey Burkhardt, unfortunately. Just able to get the Garrison Cat down alongside the Giant Killer. And a second Grow Spiral for Kowalski. So similarly to the Pult Collector, it's just like, okay, yeah, you win. Pretty much, pretty much. The second one is a lot less powerful because, you know, you do not want to be casting them uh, back to back, you know, especially against an aggressive matchup like this. You want to be affecting the battlefield, but, you know, when Corey's missing land drops and only playing one mana spells, the deck does not look as impressive. But luckily, we got a land off top to help. We did indeed, so now I can start throwing out a few extra bodies. Perhaps Raise the Alarm is going to come down first. Hoping for a Venerated Loxodon off the top to just buff this team and make this battlefield a force to be reckoned with for Corey. Yeah, exactly here. And I mean, from uh, Gregor's side, he definitely just wants to make sure there is just two or three land drops on top. And curving out Gross Spiral into Uro, into Nissa is going to be very effective against this plan, no matter if Loxodon's on top or not. So we will, uh, we will see soon enough. We shall indeed. There's Growth Spiral. Getting a few extra lands, taking a look at another card off the top of the library. Temple of Plenty is scrying. Where does this go? Corey's going to be pretty interested to see where it ends up. And ideally here for Kowalski, he's going to be landing this Nyssa as soon as possible. Get some creatures in the way of these itty bitty weenies who aren't very impressive right now, but just give them a few turns and they will be rather large and in charge indeed. Yeah, this deck is a deck that really impressed me, you know, watching the Red Bull untap event from home. Just the utter dominance from the deck, just destroying Team of Rec player after Team of Rec player. Didn't see too much Bant action uh, up against it, although I know um, in the top eight, I believe, uh, Bant was defeated by this. So it's a match that the Mono White players have on their radar, of course, because it is one of the more popular decks, uh, but for sure not the one, not the matchup they are for sure looking for. No, not at all. So now he has an interesting decision. No third land here for Corey Burkhardt just yet. Finds a Hunted Witness off the top. So we can get two more creatures down, but how many creatures do we want to commit to this battlefield? You know, uh, if he's worried about any Shadow of the Skies or anything, which there are three in the main deck, it's a case of, okay, I don't want to put too much down, so I'm just going to swing in here with my 
Season Hello Blade and just try and chip away at your life total till I get to a point where I can give all my critters indestructible, I can buff them up and then get in for the win. Yeah, it, it is a very tough battle to figure out exactly how much you want to progress into this battlefield. But, I mean, the one thing that Mono White has is basically when every, every creature dies, you're getting another body to replace it. I mean, you have the Hollow Blade to be able to live through a Wrath. Selfless Savior helps as well. So this battlefield in particular is not that weak to a Shatter of the Sky, but it is weaker to just uh, Greg just absolutely progressing the board in such a way that eventually his better creatures are going to get the job done. Yeah, for sure. So taking a look now, we have five creatures down. We do have Badger Solidarity that we can give uh, counters to all of our creatures for. We also have the Giant Killer that can tap down any big threats. Speaking of big threats, here comes a slightly bigger threat in a Hydroid <laughs> Crisis. But uh, yeah, I mean, Kowalski's just kind of, he's not getting off to this impressive start that the Bant Ram players usually like to get off to, right? At this point, you would have expected to see Nissa down, Uro out of the graveyard, growth spirals of plenty. He's just not getting there right now. Yeah. Yeah, really needed that untapped fifth land there. That is a big deal. But I mean, that is one of the problems with Bant Ramp. There is a lot of lands that come into play tapped because three color mana bases are tricky to work. So it's a price you pay for such an absurd power level um, that you get from playing Bant Ramp. Exactly right. And this next, uh, this next attack is going to be quite painful here. You know, all of our creatures now are two power or greater so these flying jellyfish hydra snake things are gonna have to chump a few things here maybe yeah exactly that attack all button is a mono white player's best friend when it comes to putting a bunch of creatures or a bunch of counters on your creatures and just getting the game finished and i mean yeah this is a tricky blocking situation right here i do not envy gregor kowalski trying to piece together how to get out of this <laughs> well, he's going for the creatures that uh, either give indestructible or leave creatures behind. So an interesting choice now. Do we sacrifice the selfless savior to keep the hunted witness alive or are we happy to let them both die? What's the what's the best out here for uh, Corey Burkhardt? Yeah, I think uh, I think you just want to trade these creatures, keep bodies off the battlefield of Greater Kowalski's, because mm -hmm. right now, I mean, you uh, you just have lethal coming back, and I mean, one creature not yeah. going to be enough. You know, I mean, a couple creatures gain some life with Uro, that might be helpful. But as it stands, this is just a dominant battlefield from Corey, who had a one lander to start this and didn't hit a second land, you know, <laughs> uh, for a couple turns, and still looks far ahead. It's impressive. It is at that, and, you know, we can get a creature down with Nissa who shakes the world. Uh, it's possible, I think, to get Nissa down and get Uro out, just to gain a little bit of extra life. But, you know, but still, this is a very, very precarious position here for, for Kowalski, who, you know, you'd expect to be running away with this matchup in most instances, but this white weenie deck has just proven how darn good it can be at closing out games quickly. 100%. I totally agree with you. I mean, the one thing Gregor Kowalski can do is, you know, play that Nissa, untap a land, play Uro, but that would tap the 3 3 creature. So, I mean, from my standpoint, I think you are just really priced into playing Nissa, untapping, trying to block that uh, 4 1 seasoned Hollow Blade, and, and hope there's nothing else from Corey. Take five damage and try to contain the battlefield after that. But that's a scary play. There are so many things that kill you. Um, and, you know, even as I say that right now, <laughs> giant, giant, giant killer can just tap down the land. And then we have yeah. seven instead of six or instead of five. So. Looks like we're digging for a shadow of the sky. Don't find it, though. It's a hallowed fountain off the top of the library. So now you're going to think that Kowalski is all out of outs. Temple of Mystery, Temple of Enlightenment down to scry. Can he find anything? I don't think so. Maybe he's just taking a look at the top of the library being like, where were you? <laughs> how close or how far were you from <laughs> saving me here? But even then, like hey, all the Liz, creatures that get left behind with the... Uh... Yeah, don't, don't ever look. 
You know, in a in, in Magic <laughs> Online, where they're like, "Would you like to reveal your hand or take a look at the next card?" I'm just like, "Nope, no, thank you." <laughs> impressive right. i always go the other way i have to look every time i know it's bad but i just can't resist why do you do that to yourself oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right so sideboard times now what do we do against bant ramp as a white weenie player Gideon Blackblade seems like an auto-inclusion here. Just another threat that doesn't get hit by Shatter the Sky. It seems to make a lot of sense to me. Um, outside of that, I mean, I guess we could go fight as one to protect from Shatter. But if they have Teferi Time Reveler, then that card is not that great. Mm -hmm. So I think I like just the proactive Planeswalker here. Uh, and Corey seems to agree. That seems like a great addition to the deck. It's kind of tempting to bring in glass caskets for the Uros and, you know, any other little creatures like Joel Rill. But, you know, for the most part, I think the game plan just has to be get your creatures out, make them big and bulky, and let's beat this opponent as quick as we can. Exactly. And we did see Corey bringing in a bounty agent. That is a, yeah. that is a spicy one. That is an absolute Yeah, that's a card one. we haven't seen forever. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever seen it in a constructed event, you know? I mean, it, but it is very good. Destroying a legendary permanent. Uh, there's a ton of them from the mm -hmm. Bant Ramp side, so it makes sense. And it's still a decent body. Yeah, it is, that's great at picking off any uh, stray Uros. So instead of a glass casket, at least you get a vigilant, you know, 2 2 body that you can pump up with a team, invoke out the venerated Loxodon. So, yeah. Yeah, there isn't the Conclave Tribunals that uh, Mono White Agro have had in the past. That was kind of this unconditional removal spell against basically everything. You're uh, left with Bounty Agent now to deal with the most powerful mythics and rares in the format. <laughs> I mean, you can still play Conclave Tribunal if you want to. Just, you know, with Teferi running around and being able to bounce things doesn't seem like the best option, unfortunately. Exactly. There's a lot of ways to deal with enchantments these days. What do you think about this opening hand here for Corey? Oh, feels like kind of a trap. It feels like something you have to mulligan. Loxodon is already pretty <laughs> bad, and only having access to one creature is just not going to be good enough. But this one looks a lot better. Yeah, this hand looks pretty good indeed. No one drop, though, which is not something that you want to see. Uh, but three two drops and unbreakable formation to protect against any board wipes, of which there is one in Kowalski's hand as he gets Joel Rail Mwamvuli Recluse out on the battlefield. Absolutely. And now we got uh, some nice plays here. I mean, just curving out Season Hollow Blade into Hollow Blade or Bounty Agent. Very solid plays. And then Ven Venerated Loxodon uh, to really go over the top here. Corey's hand is really developing here. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, another Joel Rail off the top of the library there for Kowalski. But if he is forced to Shadow the Sky, then we can replay that at a later stage. So no card draw, no kitty cat. I am sad. You know how sad I get when there's no cats in the battlefield, Corey. Oh, I hear you on that one. I hear you. And I think Gregor Kowalski is just <laughs> as sad right now with that turn three play, not being an Uro, not being a Teferi, which would have absolutely shifted this game's dynamic very, very quickly. It's just not the draw that Gregor Kowalski really wanted to have so far. Mm. But on the other side of things, Corey Burkhardt's looking pretty good. We've got the Bounty Agent down, we have a Hunted Witness along with the Hallow Blade, and we're going to follow that up next turn with another Hallow Blade and a Venerated Lockstone if he wants to commit that much to the battlefield. But we have to be aware of the Shadow yep. Sky. So it's going to be interesting to see if we go just straight for the Unbreakable Formation, keep that to use in response. It's going to pick his spot. Exactly. And I mean, you can you have a lot of creatures that survive Shatter the Sky right now just by discarding cards and stuff, but you are losing a lot of resources with Hollow Blade. So it, that can't that plan can't work forever um, when you're the mono white player. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the aggressive decks have a pretty hard time as is. You know, just trying to get cards. <laughs> your opponent keeps killing your Hallow Blade or trying to. You're you're in essence, you know, giving yourself card disadvantage by chucking a bunch of stuff. Ooh, but Gideon Blackblade yep. off the top. That's a very nice pickup indeed. 
that had to have been the best draw right now because that is something you can for sure put on the battlefield it really is not in a huge danger of dying outside of uh top decking anissa so Corey's probably gonna mm-hmm. be a little aware of that uh you gotta leave hunted witness back anyways against a 2-2 so you're kind of insulated against that 3-3 so gideon was just perfect here another card that you just want to slam and does not get hit by shatter this guy <laughs> No, it doesn't, and its loyalty will be high enough that if the Hydro Crisis doesn't block, it's not going to die to it, so... Now the pressure is really on Gregor Kowalski to find an answer. Joel Rail was taken care of by the Bounty Agent, so doing what it does best, destroying a legendary permanent, and here comes the Season Hellblade in for another three points of damage. And just look at this, Alias V. I mean, we have Hunted Witness that will bring back a 1-1. One, one. All we have to do is discard a card with Seasoned uh, Hollow Blade. And then Gideon's, you know, is a Planeswalker that will obviously survive Shatter this guy. It's just a deck that is taking advantage of Wrath Effects like Shatter the Sky in such a good way, which Mono White usually cannot do. So it is a very impressive uh, direction that this Mono White deck has, has leaned into. Yeah. M21 certainly gave it a few more tools to work with in the season Hello Blade, the Selfless Savior. So I'm personally, I'm really happy to see this archetype back and doing very, very well in the current meta because it's such a fun deck to play. You know, if you like explosive magic and winning as quick as you, well, maybe not as quick as you possibly can, but it just <laughs> it picks up wins very, very quickly. It's it's awesome. I totally agree. I was a big fan of the history of Benalia uh, Mono White deck. I played a ton of that deck. Throw some blue in for negates. That was my style. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and one of the other cards that I've been super impressed with from M21 is Joel Rail. You know, including this in the Bant Ramp decks, it just makes perfect sense because these decks are often quite, uh, you know, susceptible or vulnerable to the aggressive strategies but just being able to create a 2-2 like every single turn almost with the amount of card draw that's in the deck and also having this insane finish with joel rail's activated ability you know if you've got an uro down if you can draw a bunch of cards with hydro crisis your opponent sometimes forgets that she can pump the entire team by the amount of cards in your hands and just like oh whoops i'm dead on the crackback eh, didn't see that coming yeah yeah, I 100% agree. And I mean, all the cards in the Bant Ramp deck are basically all replacing themselves already. So it is just so nice to be able to be playing really proactive threats that are already very good that replace themselves. But then all of a sudden, you just have to look at Jariel and just be like, I have to kill this or I'm going to die as well. So it is a very tricky card. Yeah, you just kind of, she flies under the radar, right? It's just like, oh, cute, you're making cats. Oh, wait, these cats are enormous now. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It gets carried away a lot. And I've been watching your stream lately while you were playing Bant and just dominating with it. And I saw like maybe three or four matches in a row where people were just kind of not thinking about that Jorial. And all of a sudden, you just hit them for like 18 or 19. It, it was fun to watch. It was very fun to play too. Like bent rampant, it feels really good, right? I'm 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 not going to beat around the bush as much as I like aggressive decks. These decks that are just so incredibly powerful, bent ramp, team reclamation, they are very good at winning, and it's no surprise that we're seeing that many players playing it this weekend. Exactly. You know, I mean, uh, Strotsky and uh, everybody else from uh, the Czech house decided to play it as well. Uh, you know, they have some Narsets in their list that are extremely good against Team of Reclamation and other Gross Spiral decks. So really excited to, uh, you know, kind of see that play out and see if they guess the metagame correctly, essentially. Oh, oh man, that was so cool. So Joe Royal's ability just being used there to pump up the Hydro Crisis, making it a 5-5, killing Gideon. But now Kowalski has to deal with this onslaught here. Unbreakable formation, vigilant, indestructible creatures flying at your face. What are you going to do about that? Ah, that's painful. Mm. Cry, I guess. <laughs> well, yeah, cry, I guess, is, is usually a thing to do. But, you know, he is in such a good position now as Corey Burkhardt because Shadow the Sky, sure, that's in hand, but we've got two creatures. We have two cards in hand indestructible we re replace the two other ones with other creatures so this is just game over here for kowalski isn't it yeah it's just looking so bad for the gross spiral deck that we all think is just so dominant against these aggro decks and alias we couldn't have been more wrong this was a beating so far from the mono white side 
<laughs> it was a beating. <laughs> it's a beating indeed. And you know what's even funnier is that he gets to draw a card off of the shadow of the sky. <laughs> oh my goodness. There we go. Oh, Corey man. Burkhardt picking up the win with mono white aggro. I love to see it. I bet Cedric is enjoying this so much. Yep. Corey, what a freaking good game that was. Oh man, I love Corey it. B I love just it. proving that he is the better Corey B here with that just dominating <laughs> victory. You love to see the aggro decks beating the deck that's supposed to beat aggro. That was insane. <laughs> man, just finding the exact right combination of cards and indestructible creatures, just proving how good they are. Creatures that replace themselves. So I'm looking forward to seeing more mono white aggro. And we will be right back, friends, after this very short break with more action from Glagoski versus Cunio. We'll see you soon. This dragon fire off the top is gonna allow Ray to be able to two for one himself again to get rid of the second Regisaur. But now this, uh, you know, the Strider is uh, still a big threat here. Having a great card in hand, we see a Scry into another Woe Strider. There's a Cinder Vines down, able to take out a Reclamation. Ping yeah, was, for all the non-creature spells that get cast. Yeah, that was a perfect draw for William there. Give, gives him a, a great turn here with the double spell. Two very powerful ones at that. Bottom, bottom. Definitely uh, not ideal for Ray there. He <laughs> bottom spiral and pull. And, ooh. Night Peak Ambusher with only one, one green, green mana. Source. That's no. devastating. That's definitely it feels bad. Ray sitting here with the dog. That honestly, that play. that night pack ambusher could have really brought Ray back into this game, but being stuck on single green is pretty brutal. Yeah, would have been able to block that first woe strider, generate a token. Yeah. Uh, block the second woe strider every single turn using the tokens being generated. Instead, we are seeing potentially just a game get ended here. A ooh, second ooh, cinder ooh, vines. Ooh. Oh no, right, you are not in a good spot. Big time draw there. And yeah, I really, I don't see, there's no storm drafts in raises. Oh, looks like. Democratic just going threat after threat after threat. Here comes the Wilderness Reclamation, unable to even impact this game state. In fact, would end the game even sooner by giving a target for the Cinder Vines. Wow, and there and it is. that's game. William Craddock, our champion from Players Tour 3. Welcome back to the Players Tour final. I'm Ailey Loney alongside Corey B, the best Corey in my opinion. But uh, we did just see Corey Burkhardt take down Gregor Kowalski with good old mono white aggro. We're going to jump into another match here very, very shortly. It is going to be Piotr Glagowski versus Andrew Cunio. It's four color reclamation versus mono green aggro. So, Corey, tell us a little bit about four color reclamation. Why are players bringing it for this weekend? Four Color Reclamation is still just using all the very powerful things of Teamer Reclamation, but adding to Fairy Time Reveler for the mirrors, and then adding Kenrith as this threat that is so hard to deal with, with what people are trying to attack the Reclamation decks with, which is Aethergust, Mystical Dispute, Dovin's Veto, Negates. Just cards that do not line up well with Kenrith at all, so it is sacrificing <laughs> Um, a lot of consistency because it is four colors and it has a lot more tap lands, but the power level is risen just a little bit bigger. So the ceiling on these decks is a little higher. The floor may be a little bit higher as well, uh, leading to some, but that's the gist of the fourth color. All right, well, let's see how the four colors do against the mono green aggros as we jump into this match with Piotr Glagowski versus Andrew Cunio. Both players sitting at one and one. <laughs> Are we turning off emotes? Oh no, <laughs> I was just checking there. But this is Glagowski. He's he's the emoter. <laughs> How many do you think we're gonna see? Canister this time, known for his you love think of we're the emotes. See some emotes? Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe five, six. Let's let's go for there. I'll I'll be uh I'll be on the on the lower side of things. <laughs> Right, so kicking things like off it. here, we do have Pelt Collector down on the battlefield, ready to rock and roll. Gross Spiral, the important two or uh, it's turn two play here from Gogoski. 
as the pelt collector gets a little bit bigger and more difficult to deal with. Yep, exactly. It was an interesting play there by Kunio to not just jam the second Pelt Collector. I think it's a really tough play, and I don't know exactly which one is better, but getting the Pelt Collectors down early to grow um, usually is a little bit better here. It would have been one less dance turn, um, so I suppose that is a, mm -hmm. a good enough reason to do it the way he did. Shark Typhoon off the top of the library here for Glagoski. It's got that mystical dispute in hand, which might come in handy if we find land number four here for Kunio. He'd love to get this questing beast going. Otherwise, does have the option for the gem razor, mutating it onto one of these smaller creatures. Does find the fourth land. Questing beast is a go. Questing beast is a go, but we get that nice sequence here where you have four lands, you get to grow spiral and counter something. A very, very powerful sequence that allows you to ramp and control the board a little bit. The problem is we have that second questing beast, so Andrew really didn't care too much that that first one didn't resolve. <laughs> no, he's totally fine with it. And then the second one just buffs up the team. We're going to swing in here. That's a lot of damage. Like Logoski just oh, can't yeah. handle right now. So this is a very, very short game one. Blink and you'll miss it magic. Wow, yeah, what a beating from the mono green side. But you know, <laughs> honestly, that is the game to win here because now all the red cards come in and Piotr also has just some really interesting red cards that we normally don't see because, well, he is four colors, so we have red-white spells to cast. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've got Justice Strike to deal with creatures. We've got Deafening Clarion to kill a wide board. Even Solo Blaze, which I haven't seen played very often, but, you know, it's really, really good at killing these big, bulky creatures. Yeah, there's not too many cards in the mono green deck, if any, now that I think about it, that have a higher toughness than power. So Solar Blaze is just a better shatter this guy because it doesn't draw them a card. So I really love that inclusion mm -hmm. from Piotr. So... One thing that kind of hurts, for... <laughs> I just saw his deck name. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> one thing that kind of hurts with these. <laughs> the one thing that kind of hurts with these uh, these deck lists, though, are these four color lists is the the mana base, right? Because if you want to be able to keep up with your opponent, you have to punch yourself in the face for two damage most of the time. So uh, yeah, it's kind of a trade off. It's yeah, like I'd like to play all these really powerful spells and get the edge in the reclamation mirror. Exactly. And yeah, if you ever have to put a land into play tapped, you know, as your fourth land and you're trying to play some very impactful spell, you're usually pretty punished by the mono green deck. So we'll see if that comes to to bite Piotr or if the power of uh, his deck, you know, allows him to take a victory here. Well, we shall see as Glaskos enters the battlefield and takes care of the first Pelt Collector. There is a second one in Andrew's hand, though, so he won't be too uh, torn up about that. As we see Heart's Desire, a 1-1 token from the Lovestruck Beast, along with the Pelt Collector. Here comes Uro. Big draw step from Andrew. He needs that third land to do anything really meaningful. Just another Lovestruck Beast draw would not be great. Oh. That was huge. Finds the land, swings in there, three points of damage. Down to the starting life total goes Pyotr Glagoski, who's got a few more pieces of interaction this time. Brazen Borrower in hand can send back any of these Pelt Collectors if they get a little too out of hand. Yeah, and Brazen Borrower, not the card, not the piece of interaction you really want against these mono green decks, but you know, I mean, when it comes to these hyper aggressive decks that don't really give you any time or any leeway, you just have to bring in all the interaction so you can get out these mystical disputes, so you can get out these negates and Dovin's vetoes, and just try to protect your life total at all costs. Yeah, for sure. So we're going to see a few chumps here, perhaps from a Shark Typhoon, maybe even a Brazen Borrower just sending one of these creatures back. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but Kyoto's not playing any big creatures, right? The things you typically bring in against aggressive decks, so no uh, no wolves, no Gargaroths, nothing like that to help keep him alive a little bit. <laughs> 
Yeah, honestly, Piotr had to make that choice when he chose to play four colors. His Gargaroth, his mm -hmm. Nightpack Ambushers are Arkenrus, the Return King. You know, that is the card that is very good against aggro because you can just pay three, gain five life. But it's also good against these Teamer Reclamation decks because of the, the points I made leading into this match. It's just so hard to deal with with Aether Gusts, Mystical Disputes, Dovin's Vetoes. Like, nothing really lines up great against it. So I, I, I really like... Uh, Piotr's decision to just play that instead of Nightpack Ambusher, because you know me, I am not a big fan of that card in these Team of Reclamation decks. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I'm, I'm well aware that you, uh, you you don't think too highly of our, our friendly wolf friend, but Kenroth has been very powerful. Uh, unfortunately, he's not showing up here for Glagoski right now, so he's in a bit of a pickle. He can get this Uro out if he wants to, the second one, or he can just focus on getting these creatures off the battlefield. What, what do you think is going through his mind right now? Yeah, I think uh, what's going through Piotr's mind right now is I just need to be keeping myself alive and maximizing the amount of interaction I have while trying to maximize the amount of cards I put into the graveyard to get Uro down. Uro is the card that can just completely flip this around. Uh, but right now with Piotr's big interactive spell being Petty Theft from Brazen Borrower, that is at best just a tempo swing here, but that's not solving any problems here. So it's uh, it's gonna be rough. And here comes the emotes from Piotr already. <laughs> so didn't send it away. The glass casket is destroyed by our friendly Gem Razor, and Pelt Collector is back on the battlefield here. This is not looking good here yeah, for our Mythic Championship seven winner. Yeah, I agree. Glass casket is is a card that I have been. Um, basically come every deck as a removal against mono green. It is great against, you know, cat decks. You need to deal with Mayhem Devil. You need to deal with Woe Strider. It's a great tool there. But against green, the liability of getting your Glass Casket Gem Razor when they already want to bring in that card because you have Wilderness Reclamation, it just feels really bad whenever they take your removal away and get a Pelt Collector back because Pelt Collector is going to grow again and be dominant force here. Yeah, exactly right, but he is able to get Uro Titan of Nature's Wrath out onto the battlefield, so Glagowski does now have the biggest creature, gets a little bit of extra life, gets to get another gland down on the battlefield here. So maybe, just yep. maybe, he'll be okay until he sees what's in hand there from Andrew Cunio oh, no. in the Shifting Ceratops and the Questing Beast. So this is still a very, very difficult matchup to win here, here for. Yeah, 100%. I mean, you have powerful four drops here to fight back, but Uro is just better than basically all these creatures here. So we are just at a very good stalemate here. Nobody is dramatically ahead right now. Here comes the questing beast. Pelt Collector gets a counter, swinging on in with the full team. <laughs> He's just like, right, time to put the foot on the gas. Let's get this game over and done with. Cunha is wasting no time here. We will meet again. Wow, I'm kind Take of surprised of by that, you know, getting the rid of, uh... beast. Yeah, that, is, that, that seemed like a little bit of an aggressive attack, but I mean, it is just trying to get this game over with, realizing that Uro will take over eventually here. Yep, swinging in here, protection from multicolored, so two creatures bouncing off each other. We do have the Scorching Dragonfire to take care of a creature. We can play a second Uro, pad the life total a little bit more, keep the one that's on the battlefield, get some more cards, get some more life, finding another Uro. Okay, sure, why not? Let's just play them all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a lot of life to uh, give yourself a buffer, even if, um, you know, Kunio just goes all offensive next turn. So this is uh, turning into a very close game. Yeah, I mean, th these draws from uh, Glogowski have just been so, so good. Just three life each time finding Uro, getting an extra land on the battlefield, setting himself up really, really nicely here to mount a comeback. So now it's all on Kunio to get this game over and done with as quick as he can. Yeah, and then Scorching Dragonfire to eliminate a problem as well. This is a pretty impressive comeback here from Piotr. Yeah, those Uro is just showing up at exactly the right time. 
getting to keep one on the battlefield, you know, I possibly thought Kunio might have blocked it just to keep this massive threat down, but uh, yeah, it's just, it's looking, it's looking like uh, Glagoski's mounting a comeback. Yeah, it really is. And this gem raiser is a very powerful play, but Brazen Borrower here is just going to be so nice as another huge tempo swing uh, for Andra. And I'm tempoing out a mono green deck, usually not what you want to be doing, but when you have Uro progressing, that is a, a perfectly good plan. Mm -hmm. Uro's swinging on in again, finding a Triumph off the top of the library, not what Grigowski wants to find. He can cycle those away though, just to see if there is something more useful on top of the library here to deal with these creatures. Here we're going to fire off the growth right, spiral, get another land here. down onto the battlefield. Going to need something big here. Mm-hmm. Gonna need something big indeed. Let's cycle this Triumph. Let's find something. It's an Aether Gust. Okay, that's good. Interaction. Let's send one of these Whoa. creatures back. And uh, yeah, just keep applying the pressure. Yeah, that is about exactly what Piotr wanted here. Just more interaction, constant interaction. Uh, but Aether Gust much better than Brazen Borrower. The fact that it prevents essentially the next draw step from Kunio so much better than just being able to keep replaying threats and then drawing new threats on top of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm gonna draw Ooh, all the cards I possibly can and try and stay alive. Oh, yes. that's rough but only one mana, yep. And there we're seeing the problem with the four color decks, you know? I mean, there's just so many more triumphs. There's eight compared to four, and we see it right here. It would have been huge to have an untapped land because you could actually ether gust that shifting ceratops on the stack, but with it being in play, yeah. that is just what, you know, that is just what Piotr has to live with now. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you think about your, pro <laughs> you know, you think about what you did. But uh, firing off that oops there, he knows that <laughs> it would have been better to keep up that Aether Gust because here comes the team swinging on in. We're going to block the Lovestruck Beast. Oh, the rest of the team gets in for a bunch of damage. Down to seven he goes. Now he's got to think about how he sequences these next few turns. Can he yeah, even stay alive here? Because, I mean, Uro... Yeah, that's why it's getting so... Oh, hello. Oh, that's what he needs. My. Oh! Can he stay alive, though? Wow! Uh, yeah, he can draw that with Uro. That is huge! He can draw that with Uro attacking. Yeah! <laughs> he's wow, like, what oh, is Piotr doing? <laughs> <laughs> I think he's extremely hey, excited that he top decked the exact card so. that he's kind of trolling us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow! <laughs> I wouldn't put it past him. So in with Uro, blocking again, bouncing off that Stone Cold Serpent, but it's not going to matter. Solar Blade is going to take care of this battlefield. Goodbye, everybody. Nice little reset there. And one sweet, one nice piece of interaction that may not be completely obvious there is Stone Coil Serpent died to a multicolored deal damage effect, but Stone Coil Serpent deals damage to itself. So it's an artifact dealing damage to mm -hmm. it, which will kill it with that. An interesting interaction with some of oh. boys there. <laughs> and look here, expansion <laughs> explosion on the top two. So Wilderness Reclamation, down on the battlefield you go. Let's get this over wow. in a big old boom. Man. Yeah, and that's just lethal Lugoski right just there. just held on here. Insane draws off the top. <laughs> wow. Wow. Goodness me. I what mean, a turn of is... events. Yeah, that is one thing that most team or reclamation decks don't really have access to is an unconditional wrath against them. You know, you have the storm's wrath, which mm -hmm. kills most things, and it would have killed. It would have actually been better on that board because it would have left Uro alive. But you know, up against an eight-eight stone coil serpent and stuff, you really have no answer for that except bouncing it with brazen borrower, and that's not good enough. Solar Blaze is a really cool addition to this deck. Oh man, that's that was an absolutely 
well-fought battle there by Glugowski. Just being able to get back into that, finding those, what was it, three Uros back to back, just digging through the library, getting as much mana down as he can, and finding the answers he needed eventually in those Storm's Wrath, or excuse me, in the uh, Soda Blazes, so... <laughs> What a game. Yeah, it was so impressive. He really needed one of those solar blazes on the exact turn that he cast it. And the fact that he saw both of them, he was probably just laughing out loud in his <laughs> chair because that was the perfect two cards to look at. <laughs> oh, yes. Just like, ha look at my cards. Look at them again. All right, here we go. Game number three, Piotr Glugowski, Andrew Cudio, Mono Green Aggro, four color reclamation. Let's see who takes it. This hand is awful. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Looks like Mulligan from both players there. Mm -hmm. All right, looking much better finding the third color we need. Paradise Druid is a really cool addition, uh, uh, Dracunio here. You have so many four drops that are so important and you don't want to play, you know, too many lands. You know, we want to play normally around 24 to 25 and you kind of get to cheat that number a little mm -hmm. bit with Paradise Druid and allows you to just play these impactful fours on turn three. Like... Andrew Cunio just attempted there, but unfortunately getting gusted away. So Questing Beast is going to hang out on top of the library. Uh, we do have the Brazen Borrows Petty Theft, so again, we'll try and resolve our friendly Questing Beast. And if Lugoski chooses, he can send it right back. Yeah, and once again, though, this is not really solving problems. This is just putting band-aids over questing bees over and over again. But with that Kenrith, in, you know, in hand, that is something that can, uh, <laughs> that something that can really get them back into it. But Piotr's going to need one of those solar blazes more than likely at some point. Oh yes, has found Kenrith this time, so that is at least something that we can get in the way of one of these big creatures. But uh, it's not going to. It's, it's just a temporary solution to, uh, in, you know, a rather impactful problem. Exactly. And I mean, the one thing that uh, Piotr does have going for him is, sure, he doesn't have an impactful play this turn, but here is the one benefit of all these triomes is when you have nothing to do, at least you can cycle it away and try to find your impactful spells. Yep. Ooh. The fairy would be impactful, but Shifting Ceratops says no. Oh no! Primal Might is gonna put the end of this game. Impressive here. Kenrith is a risk there. The other <laughs> know that there this was a chance that this could happen, but wow, that card is just doing doing work this turn. <laughs> Goodbye, Kenrith. Here comes Shifting Ceratops wow. and the Paradise Druid <laughs> getting this game over and done with for Andrew Cunio. Mono Green Aggro picking up another victory. Wow. <laughs> I suppose that's what Bottom you get when you face one green. You're going to get stumped on, huh? <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, impressive so work again super... from Andrew Cunio. Mono green still proven. <laughs> still proven it's good. That's for sure. Yep. Mono green is definitely one of the uh, best aggro decks in this tournament this weekend. So we'll, we'll probably see a bit more of it, I, I think, in a little bit. But we're going to take a very short commercial break, friends. And when we come back, we're going to have more from round two after this. Cry of the Carnarium. Do you counter this? I don't think so. Great. You just yeah. let it happen. You have a, you have a three three. It you is a three three, three, three Terramander. Yeah, you can just let it happen. Well, it's three damage in. Again, the Terramander cannot be adapted. It already has a plus one plus one counter on it. I don't think you can block here. If you block, you, you are not giving yourself the best shot at winning. I think. If you're in a Kawa seat, you think you just have to hold your breath yeah. and take the three here. And yeah, it's a random card for Burchat. If that's you know, the, mm -hmm. hard, the hard counter that loses you the game, so be it. But Birch, oh my goodness, it was wow, a hard counter. It actually counter. is the hard Look counter that's going to lose that you the game. <laughs> Two Wizards Retorts and a Spell Pierce. Ikawa can still chump block this turn. Right. But chump blocking is unlikely to, to win him the game here. Is there anything good under there, or is Autumn Burchett your first Mythic Championship winner? That's just from a dive England? down. He missed. He, missed. he effectively missed here. Autumn Burchett is simply looking on and saying, what do you want to do, Ikawa? Because they know in hand 
are a pair of Wizards retorts and an effectively unbeatable situation for Autumn Burchett. This is incredible stuff down the stretch here as Ikawa tries to figure out if there's any possible way for him to get out of this, but there isn't. Beautiful, beautiful sequencing, prioritization, really valuing what is important here. And there's Kaya's Wrath. That is going to be met with a counter spell. And is this going to be it? Are we going to see the hand get extended? This is it. Counter spell number two for Autumn Burchett. And England has a Mythic Championship winner, and it's Autumn Burchett. <laughs>Hey everybody, welcome back to coverage of the Players Tour Finals. Maria Bartholdi here at our virtual news desk with Cedric Phillips and Riley Knight. And Cedric, you know, you're a guy who likes to play monocolor decks, and it looks like they're doing okay this far in the tournament. Well, Maria, let's be clear. Monocolor aggressive decks. Not control decks, <laughs> not mid-range decks. Monocolor aggressive decks. And so far, not so bad. Uh, mono green, mono white. Now, of course, we, we posted the metagame kind of breakdown on social media, on Twitter and stuff like that. So everybody knows the team of Reclamation is, you know, around the 50%, if you, especially if you loop in four-color Reclamation. And the monocolor aggressive strategy is mono white, mono green. Not that big of a percentage of the metagame, but the reason that these decks are being played is pretty simple. With everybody trying to beat team of Reclamation, and more importantly, team of Reclamation trying to beat team of Reclamation, that means that they can't afford to main deck cards like Storm's Wrath and Scorching Dragonfire and Bone Crusher Giant and all the cards that a monocolor aggressive mage like me would not want to see and if that's the case game one's kind of on the house and then hopefully you win one of those sideboarded games and so far that's kind of the plan for mono white and mono green and though the matches that we've watched haven't been so much against team of reclamation it's important that those aggressive strategies are able to beat those non-team of reclamation decks as well because if they feel like they're good against the team of reclamation and four color reclamation decks and they're beating the non-reclamation decks well sign me up life is good I know, right? And Riley, you said that this is what you wanted to have happen here this weekend, and your dream has come true already. <laughs> yeah, it's been really good to see people challenging the established orthodoxy and dominance of Team Reclamation. Look, it's not a whitewash. It's not just going to be Team Reclamation, you know, out for the counter or anything like that. But people are standing up to the dominance of the deck. I've got some updates from the floor as well. Um, some players, of course, you know, playing bravely unafraid of cliche uh, and, and well. I mean, tore off Toffel Severin, the mythic champion, right? You're going to hear unbiased coverage of, uh, of me bringing you his results throughout the weekend. <laughs> and uh, like the true maverick he is, like, well, I mean, what a trailblazer. He also played team reclamation he was impressed by some of the um the tech that came from the checks from the old tech republic there they were playing uh, discontinuity he almost played tails end but uh, in, in any case went with a pretty stock list he's now two and oh he beat out lishi chan uh who you may re remember is on rakdos sacrifice apparently the games were ridiculously close he got the chance to catch up with toffel uh, he said that lee used uh, priest plus liliana's standard bearer the new one from m21 uh, to draw a bunch of cards wasn't enough to beat the luckiest man on earth of course and so toffel is now two and oh people be pleased to hear the ken yuka hero with esper midrange continue to crush his enemies uh eating Esther uh, esther trujillo who was on mono green aggro it uh, turns out that the Esper deck is not just uh, not just good against uh, Teema, a bit more ranged, this deck, which is nice to see. And I got the chance to catch up with Martin User as well, everyone's favourite Hall of Famer. Uh, he's on Teema Rec 2 and beat another Hall of Famer, Ben Stark, who was playing Esper Rats. Martin said that he drew perfectly, must be very nice, drawing Spiral into Rec in game number one. And in game number two, after drawing a grip full of counter spells, Ben did manage to sneak a uh, Teferi onto the battlefield, but it wasn't enough. Martin was ready with the Blast Zone, and so one off the back of his two copies of Wilderness Reclamation. He said he is supremely confident with Teema. He does think that Growth Spiral is one of the best cards in the format at the moment. It's been winning tournaments for nine months. He says it, it was a mistake not to play team of reclamation this weekend and i've actually just on my other monitor got some updates here alive coming to you hot and fresh my friends from william huey jensen uh who has been kind enough to let me know that he is <laughs> so he's playing mono green he bit mono white in five minutes he says it took about five minutes uh we both mostly played on curve he says but i just had bigger creatures and the opponent drew none of their creature pump so uh unsurprising to see mono green uh, outclass mono white on the battlefield when they don't have enough anthem effects that does seem pretty typical there uh, and oh wow well okay my goodness <laughs> Huey says in game two uh, the opponent played two glass caskets and I drew two gem raisers so uh, yeah that's uh, that's an equation that solves itself there some very interesting updates coming in from around the floor and of course I'll be back uh, between all the rounds to bring you all the latest gossip from our, our virtual tournament floor
I'm here. Uh oh. Looks like we may have right lost Maria here, Maria. Cedric. We may we may That's indeed have lost face. Maria. Uh, it is a sad well, face you know indeed. What? But uh, the good news, the good news, my friends, so you, is at least you, that we have another I'm, I'm archetype breakdown go. for you here. Yeah. We've got an archetype breakdown coming your way, my friends. It looks like we've got Mono Green next up in the hopper. So let's take a look at what this deck is all about. Welcome to the Players for Finals Archetype Overview. Let's take a look at the aggro decks. Aggro comes in two main flavors at this player's tour, green and white. Both decks are looking to exploit a field full of greedy ramp decks by reducing the opponent's life total to zero as quickly as possible. The mono green deck wants to land early pelt collectors and powerful two drops, then slams the game shut with cards like Questing Beast. Primal Might does double duty here, removing a pesky blocker and beefing up your best creature for a big attack. The mono white deck, on the other hand, wants to go wide early with innocuous looking one and two drops before using Bossery Solidarity and Glorious Anthem to pump those creatures to intimidating proportions. There are a few mono red and dual color decks in the field too. However, they all follow roughly the same strategy. Win before the opposing player lands a Nugan or goes off with Reclamation. With so much of the metagame taken up by Team of Reclamation decks, aggro just might be the best way to sneak into the top 8. All right, my friends, we are going to catch up now with another player's tour champion here. Elias Watzfeld, Cedric, is a, a bloke out of Sweden who managed to take down one of the players tour online uh, and uh, did very well for himself there. And we got the chance to catch up with Elias here as well and see what his thoughts were heading into this tournament. Just qualifying, yeah, that was fairly easy. Winning the tournament, slightly more difficult. Uh, so I'm, I'm not fearful of the competition in, in, in a way. It was difficult. It took me 17 years to actually win something big. Well, that's Elias Wattsfeld there. Good to hear from him as we head into this tournament. And of course, the very best of luck to him because he's our next featured player. He's one of our two feature match, uh, two, two players we'll see in the feature match area coming up right now, Cedric. We can have a look at the head-to-head -head here and see who Elias Wattsfeld will be doing battle with and what kind of deck he might uh, very well be up against here. Because, of course, Martin User as a Hall of Fame, a very, very strong opponent for what's felt to play here. And uh, Martin User is, once again, bravely unafraid of cliche. He's on Team Reclamation, Cedric. Uh, and I think with good reason. You know, one of the things that's interesting about tournaments like this, Riley, right? You know, competitive Magic players of all shapes and sizes, when you play in a tournament like this and you're filling out your deck list, the big question is, am I going to regret what I'm registering? You know, you can convince yourself to play Mono White, but, you know, mm -hmm. you could also say if you play Mono White and you go 0-4, you know, you know, you know what, maybe I should have registered Girl Spiral. What was I thinking as you're sitting in your rocking chair, 78 yeah, years yeah. old, just thinking to yourself, ah, I had the chance to play Girl Spiral and I didn't do it. Both these players are playing Girl Spiral and Martin feels so strongly. He's just like, I just have to play the card. It's too good. And Elias feels the same way. You see right here, Team Reclamation Mirror is what's coming up for you here in just a moment. Now, if you look, if you take a look at key cards in the matchup, the thing I'm looking for is how many main deck negates how many main deck copies of mystical dispute stuff like that have people geared their deck for the mirror elias definitely has you see these three copies of ether gust you've got three negates main deck you've got four mystical disputes main deck so it's very telling that look i want these kind of permission type spells to be able to give myself a bit of an edge in the mirror of course you're going to find shark typhoon and wilderness reclamation expansion explosion and grow spiral those are mainstays in this deck but there are some flex spots here it's a little bit of flexibility in deck building no main deck copies of night pack ambusher as an example no main deck scorching dragon fires bone crusher giants were the aggressive strategies so those main deck copies of negates and gust are going to give lies a little bit of a, a you know a little bit of some game here in game number one but the big question is is what is yuza bringing to the table what is martin bringing to the table to combat the mirror because we know he's playing team of reclamation as well and that's the big question right is how does he want to go about doing it so now we take a look at that deck list and we see all right well of course you got one wreck sharp typhoon expansion explosion euro all that stuff Miss Cold disputes four as well uh excuse me ether gust all right just one and then negates three as well and you've got that kind of little miser's copy of Jarrell, uh the recluse there the early two drop maybe a little bit better against aggressive strategies slide in against the mirror as well so 
you see kind of the different the different the, the differences in deck building but more, most importantly to note here riley is that both of these players have geared their main decks for the mirror and the way you can really notice that is those main deck copies of negate mystical dispute is of course kind of a stock thing that everyone has kind of settled on as a four of in the main deck because it's great in the mirror and just it's good enough against the aggressive decks but those negates man that's key you can tell that both these players they want to beat each other and they're both great so this should be a lot of fun to watch Absolutely, and it is interesting to see the way that these decks get uh, get teched out uh, in in different ways as a, a format continues to become a sort of more inward facing, as they you know as, as the best deck yep. tries to beat the best deck and uh, and so on and so forth. Now we are going to bring you live coverage of the next round, of course, but before that, as we're gearing up and getting ready for it, I want to share something with you. I actually got the chance to catch up with Mike Sigrist, uh, Siggy, as he's known to many of his friends and family and uh, and fans around the world. Um, had uh, look. You know, things got very real for him with, uh, when it came to this global pandemic that we're, uh, we're all going through at the moment, uh, Cedric. And yeah. I was lucky enough to, to actually catch up with Siggy and get his perspective uh, on, on what his family has been going through recently. So uh, let's hear from Siggy now and, uh, and get across what, what he and his family have been going through. I'm with Mike Siggy Sigrist. Uh, Mike, uh, Mike, first of all, thanks for joining us. Uh, there, you've been dealing with a little bit of uncertainty, mate, uh, around illness in your family these past couple of weeks. Uh, do you want to tell us how difficult has it been to navigate uh, so, sort of what's going on out there in the world? Um, it's been a challenge. Uh, my wife's a healthcare worker. She works in the uh, emergency room um, at a local hospital. And so it's constantly on our mind what's going on and, uh, yeah, we had a little bit of a, a close call uh, about a week ago where my daughter was extremely ill and I was a little ill and uh, doctors seemed to think it was uh, COVID, but um, it turns out all the tests were negative, which is good news. Uh, still going to get like antibody tests and stuff to make sure. But um, yeah, it was, it's, it's been, been challenging trying to, uh, as a father and um, the husband of a healthcare worker to try to navigate and play around everything if you will well tell us a little bit more about that experience because of course what the life has changed for everyone around the world in, in in the wake of this pandemic but you know your wife heather is really at the front line she's a frontline healthcare worker she's out there fighting the fight what has it been like for you in terms of supporting her supporting your family and uh, and you know i guess just your experience of being one step removed from the from the fight against this uh, the front line of the fight against this virus um for me <laughs> For me, it's been constantly, I mean, I've been anxious the entire time, but I've been constantly trying to uh, assess the situation and basically try to be as safe as possible given the circumstances. Um, that's not only for, you know, me, my wife and my kids, but we, you know, make sure that we're isolated, we're state quarantined. We've done everything we could. We haven't seen any of our family or friends or anything since uh, February or March, uh, early March, maybe. Um, so yeah, we've just, tr I've been trying personally, I've been trying to stay educated on the, on the topic, uh, you know, first what to look for in symptoms and stuff like that. So, um, that if there's any sign of illness at home, we can, uh, kind of take it from there, but also just my wife has been a rock through all of it. She doesn't, I mean, she's not worried. She's not scared. She's just, you know, I want to go. I want to go to work. I want to do my thing, um, and uh, she's she's been less worried than I have. So I, I've been the, the the worried one here. Well, I mean, look, it sounds like she's an absolute legend. Sounds like she is uh, really one of the heroes that is uh, that is out there in in the proverbial trenches here. Um, and it's great that she's been supporting you. Great you've been supporting her, of course, and supporting your family. But, uh, you know, recently uh, you, you've been updating people as to what's going on with your family on Twitter. And recently, you know, with the more recent scare that you and your family have gone through, uh, there was a huge outpouring of support from the Magic Twitter community. Some days on Magic Twitter are good days. And uh, it must have been nice to, uh, you know, to have the gathering at your back at a time like this. Yeah, absolutely. Um... I wanted to post something uh, basically when the, I, I was convinced, my wife was not, and uh, the doctors were. At that point, I was like, I'm just going to say something because um, honestly, I was a bit nervous and scared. Uh, I wanted to say something before I got too 
potentially too sick to say something. But most importantly, I was looking for other people who may have experienced it to give me, me reassurance. And I got tons of that, um, which was uh, meant a lot and made me feel more comfortable with what was going on. Um, mm. So it, 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 it's important, like for me, someone who's going to worry a lot, uh, getting the it'll be okay from p other people who have experienced something, uh, I think is um, a, a good way to, for the community to rally around each other. And in, in case someone, you know, people in the community do feel scared or anxious about something like this. Yeah, it's so a, a, a little. Yeah. I'm glad that sorry, some sorry. people reached out to me and, and gave me that comfort. It certainly was a very, uh, you know, positive and an uplifting uh, sort of wake to the to the very distressing news that you shared uh, with the community. So, uh, you know, it was nice to see that. You know, of course, we're all in your corner at a time like this, but it is very good to hear that uh, the prognosis is not as uh, as dire as it perhaps could have been. But uh, listen, let's very briefly talk about magic. You know, you're in a position here. You're 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 trying to win this entire tournament. You're looking after uh, you know two young girls, four nearly five years old. They are two twin girls. Um, you know, you're looking after them between and sometimes in the rounds, playing high level magic from your home. Uh, you know, <laughs> how is that treating you? You still going to take this whole tournament down? Uh, I wouldn't go that far. Um, I haven't been able to play as much magic because of uh, the the whole situation. Um, mm -hmm. So, what I did was I basically my wife during this tournament is going to be at work. The entire time every minute i'm playing around it's just me and the girls in the tournament so uh mm. i chose my deck choice was heavily informed by that knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. i chose an after deck i don't think it's necessarily the best choice of the tournament I, I normal circumstances i play you know a reclamation deck this time uh good old white aggro and um after seeing a couple of lists poking around on twitter i think uh my deck choice is okay well, we'll see how well I play because, like I said, I have not been. I'm, I'm certainly going to be rusty, so I'm, I'm a little worried uh, about throwing a game away here and there. But I'm going to definitely give my best, and I'm I'm certainly going to have fun. This yeah, is not. I mean, you've got bigger fish to fry, but uh, yeah, this is not. I, I really like the the normal deck I like to play. Like I played uh, <laughs> I just, I grow in one pro tour, and it was uh, not my my. It was. I said the worst deck I've ever played at a Pro Tour, and I stand by that. So, uh, <laughs> oh wow, no, right? No, I, uh, yeah. Well, I certainly don't. I hope we don't have a repeat of that. I do like the fact that your your deck choice has been influenced not by the overall Magic meta game, but also the meta game okay. of you know your household <laughs> with two young daughters. Yeah. Siggy, so listen, mate, um, thanks very much for joining us here and having a very heartfelt chat about what's going on in, in your life. And look, I can only wish you the very best of luck throughout the weekend. I, I hope fortune favours on you, uh, favors you. But uh, thank you very much for joining us, uh, Michael Sigrist, with a, quite a, a, a quite a, a you know a very heart wrenching story, but uh, also a very heartwarming story about uh, living through this pandemic. So thanks very much, Siggy. Hey, thanks for having me. And like, and you know, there's plenty of people who've gone through much worse. So I don't, I don't want any sympathy thrown my way. I, I'll get through it. But uh, let's just try to stay together as a community and, and help each other during this tough time. Well, that's right. It's important to remember that it's not just about the magic, but it is, of course, about the gathering. Thank you very much once again to Michael Sigurds for joining us. And that is that from me, Riley. Welcome back to our virtual news desk here. Running out, joined by Cedric Phillips. And Cedric, uh, many viewers around the world actually may have missed a Cedric Phillips coverage first here on the broadcast today. Uh, I mean, have you got anything you want to share with us at the moment, Cedric? Oh, I thought I thought I might sneeze again, but it, it turns out uh, you all have just witnessed um, in my eight plus years of doing coverage, the first time I've ever sneezed on camera ever. And I was just trying to hold it in. I was clenching my teeth. I don't know if you could notice I was clenching <laughs> and then it just, it wouldn't, I, I just couldn't fight it anymore. And there it is a uh, coverage first. I'm sure other people have done it, but my first sneeze on camera of all time. I mean, we're just making history here in 2020, aren't we? I a truly historic moment. That's exactly right. Well, <laughs> listen, my friends, we have got a uh, we've got a break coming up your way, and then after that, we are going to jump down to the feature match area. Elias Watzfeld facing off against Martin User. Uh, these players, a team of reclamation mirror for Cedric right now. As I say, it's time to toss to a break, and then after that, we'll be back with live magic. And this makes it so that. Sure. 
it's going to be harder for Reed to win just through flyers alone. Exactly. It also means that cards like Exclusion Major are no longer lethal, uh, you know, right away. Right. So now Reed's going to have to look for an Entrancing Melody or an additional copy of something like a Miscloaked Herald to get back in. But he doesn't have a lot more draw steps left because Autumn is getting close to the point where they can start attacking with that Tempest Gin. It's seven power. Yeah. That would be an attack for ten. It's a Merfolk Trickster. Is this actually lethal? This is an aggressive trickster. Well, it might be lethal. Right. Two, th three, f three, four, five, six, seven, eight, plus seven. That is 12 damage. However, Reed does have a blocker in the Merfolk Trickster, right? So the Tempest Chin will get in for seven. The Merfolk Trickster can block. It doesn't look like a lethal attack unless Autumn has something else. Those are the two new creatures there that Autumn's just pulled down. Seven. Seven. It is a lethal ten, attack. Twelve. It yeah. is a lethal it attack. It is. That's just lethal. And that's going to wow. do it. Autumn Burchett moves on to the finals, defeating Reed Duke three games to one. We knew Mono Blue was going to be in the finals. We did not know who was going to be piloting it. And take a look at the reaction from Autumn. Pure elation. And Reed Duke, gracious in defeat as well. But wow. Reed, I mean, putting up that fight, though, on a mulligan to five. And it looked like he was pretty well ahead, actually. Yes. It was those two essence captures at just the right time from right. Autumn essence, that saved the game. Essence captures just doing a ton of work there. Yeah. Wow.